I believe in stories. Not any particular story, I believe in stories. Stories connect us in a powerful way that transcends mere facts and figures while simultaneously living in harmony with facts and figures. But stories work differently in our brains than facts and figures. When we hear a story and get to a disturbing or distressing moment, our brains produce cortisol, cortisol, the fight or flight stress hormone, as though we were actually in distress or disturbance. When stories make us feel care or connection, our brains produce oxytocin, which generates empathy. But this is not a trick of biology, because biology is not out to trick us. Biology, unlike people, has no ulterior motive. In this sense, science does not have an agenda, which is why it makes for such good stories. We get to make our own meaning. And today we are talking about one of those stories, the great story, the, a story with universal meaning and patterns that hold true regardless of culture. It's a touchstone, it's a container that holds all the rest of our other stories and meaning. This, uh, this week also intersects with another touchstone story that is perhaps less comforting. For many of us, this was the second anniversary of the last normal week. And for me as a minister, it is the last normal week anniversary. Because two years ago, on a Thursday, we made the decision at Northwoods to suspend in-person operations and go online that Sunday. There was not a ton of sleep between that Thursday and that Sunday, but it was worth it. Ever since that last normal week, feeling our connection to each other has become even more important and even harder to maintain. But we have endured together, grieved and celebrated and done our best side by side in each other's orbits, if not each other's presence. This two year anniversary was the perfect Sunday for the music that we're having today. These are the songs sung by our folk choir on video instead of in the sanctuary. These are the songs that the folk choir was rehearsing in March of 2020, but they never got to sing. So I'm particularly pleased that we were able to recreate that moment for, for the, for the re-entrance of the folk choir. It was, currently singing and rehearsing in person, but recording on video for our worship services. For two years, this community has been connecting across distance via these magical machines. I have one right up here on the pulpit. If you wonder when I, when I know how to talk at the right time, it's because I have a magic machine. We've been connecting across distance with these magical machines, boxes, filled with tiny plates of rock inscribed with runes that channel energy to do our work, manage our money, write our novels, make music and imagery, and me appear with just a few swipes of our fingers. In any other era of human existence, what I just said sounds like magic. And we do it every day. Looking back down a long enough timeline with a wide enough view of history, at some point everything sounded like magic. When our early ancestors, and I'm talking early, sat around their campfires and looked up at the sky, they saw tiny lights that were in utter mystery. Why were they there and what were they doing there and what did they mean? And so our early ancestors made up stories to explain how they got there. And that moment 
encapsulates so much of humanity to me, the origins of those twin engines of imagination and science. The curiosity and desire to understand the world that some now call science and the longing for connection to a larger purpose that some now call God. We come here to celebrate both our imaginations and the curiosity of science. A century ago, we lived in a universe that contained just this one galaxy. Today, we live in a universe with billions of galaxies. The stars that we see cast light from thousands or even millions of years ago, billions of years ago. Some of those stars no longer exist and we are seeing their ghosts. Astronomy is a form of time travel. Things that seemed like magic, we now understand. And it makes me wonder what will we not have understood? A hundred years from now, what are they going to be looking back that seems like magic today, but is taken for granted in that time? The kids that are here today, some of you will grow up and have kids of your own, and those kids might even have kids. What will that generation look back on us and shake their heads and go, oh, silly old people. If someone from the future had told my grandparents at my age that we'd be carrying around tiny computers connected to a worldwide information system made up of, honestly, I'm not sure what, but if you ever want to go down a deep rabbit hole, Google what is the internet made of. That's all I'm going to say about that. Some things that we know are real still sound like magic. We think about time as being linear, and yet we can look at light from stars from billions of years ago. We think of space and movement in space as being fixed, and yet in every single atom in your bodies in this entire universe, there are electrons bouncing between electron orbits, like somebody getting on an elevator on the second floor and getting off at the seventh, but disappearing while they were in the elevator. That can happen to us, that would be magic. But in an atom, it happens all the time. Atoms, evolution, light years, cell biology, a universe in which the Earth was not the center of everything. At one time, these were all unimaginable. What do we fail to imagine today? When I contemplate the stories of the universe, I like the knowing and the unknowing in equal measure. If I am very still and quiet, I can feel those metaphysical connections between myself and the farthest galaxy, between myself and my amphibious ancestors, between myself and the earliest moments of time. If I drink a glass of water, I am consuming some of those elements from the earliest of time, the hydrogen. If I am still and quiet long enough, I can rest in the web that those connections make and return to my own story with my soul renewed, heart lighter, and reality transcended.